I think a big part of the reason why we observe lower rates, severity, and later onsets of dementia among people who live more like our ancestors and less like us is that these ancestral lifestyles better accommodate these psychological realities. When you take an organism out of the environment to which its species has been adapted, all bets are off as to how well it'll do. As people who watch this channel know, a major focus of mine is the idea that humans, we are a fundamentally small scale tribal species. We spent the grand majority of our heritage living this way. However, in the modern world, we live in a very different way. So the big focus on this channel is that we have a significant mismatch between our evolved ancestral environment and the way we live now. We also have a lot of major psychosocial ills, and I do not believe that these things are unrelated. I think there is a substantial relationship between the mismatch between our evolutionary heritage and where we are now. It is a fundamental dictum of evolutionary biology. When you take an organism out of the environment to which its species has been adapted, all bets are off as to how well it'll do. Now, I've talked about a lot of psychosocial ills on this channel and related it to this issue, but one that I have not brought up at all yet is dementia. Now, this is a big one for me. As I've made passing allusion to on this channel, I'm an occupational therapist of over 11 years now. And most of that time has been spent working with seniors. And a major issue that I deal with a lot of the people I work with is dementia. Now, this has been an area that I've had a level of interest in since well before I became an occupational therapist. And it's because of my background in academic psychology. As I've made allusion to before, I did my undergraduate education at the University of Toronto. I've mentioned that I was a student of Jordan Peterson and John Verveke. I was in the psychology research specialist and cognitive science programs. I then went on to Rutgers for the master's PhD in cognitive psych and cognitive science, though I left their program when I realized how poor the job prospects are but I still love the subject matter. And so in this video, I am going to be talking not just to people interested in these kind of things, but also to patients of mine who I'm sharing this video with and their families. The idea being is I want to give an overview of why dementia is as prevalent as it is, and also what we can do to better manage it, and what we can do to even lower our odds of getting it or at least, you know, getting it severely, lowering our odds of that. So I hope this interests you and yeah, let's get started. Prior to the agricultural revolutions of the Middle East and Asia that date back to roughly 10 to 12,000 years ago, humanity spent the entirety of its history, which goes back an estimated 300 or so thousand years, being nomadic, hunter-gatherer, intensely interdependent, family-based, lifelong tribes. And this lifestyle actually goes beyond just the bounds of what we would call the modern human time period. It goes on to non-human primates, and it even goes back to some pre-primate species. So this is a style of life that has a history that goes back literally many, many tens of millions of years, whereas our more current lifestyle is not very old at all. And in many ways, it can be said that we today are members of a tribal species, but we've lost our tribes. And this is not limited to situations of single parenthood or post-divorce situations. Even intact families are often scattered across the map, seeing each other only infrequently. We move off, we switch schools, jobs, we don't attend religious service very much anymore, and so forth, and so do the majority of our neighbors. And so we are living very differently than the way in which we evolved. And even if we were to stay still and not move, the world around us changes so often because again, our neighbors move, technology changes, and every year the world changes faster and faster and faster. And so it's not unfair to say that we have never been in a time where we've been less familiar with each other and our environment, and we've never been less connected. Now, as I've said, it's an evolutionary dictum that when you take organisms out of the environment to which its species has adapted, all bets are off as to how well they will do. 
And in a world of smaller, less intact, more dispersed families where work and child rearing is done increasingly outside of the home and outside of the family, few groups are being hit as hard by these changes as senior citizens. And one of the byproducts of this, I confidently believe, is an increasing prevalence and severity of dementia. There are far more people today with dementia than there used to be in the distant past. Now, there are good reasons for this. First off, there's just way more people in general. So on those grounds alone, you would expect higher rates of dementia. Thanks, Captain Obvious. Due to medical advances, we often now survive things that 100 years ago or even less would have killed us. And so if we're living into our 80s rather than dying in our 60s, having survived things that might have killed us 100 years ago, there are going to be more people with dementia. And if that was all there was to it, maybe I wouldn't be making this video. The reason for this video in good part is that the list of factors that have driven up dementia in terms of numbers and severity are by no means limited to simply that we have more people who are living longer and are surviving things that would have killed them before. So let me start off by saying that there are already going to be some people who will challenge me and they will cite research showing declines in dementia over the last two, three decades in the United States. And I do not discount these findings. However, consider this analogy. Imagine you're living in a city that over the past 10 years has experienced an 11 fold increase in crime. But let's say that this year crime goes down by 10%. It would be more than a little misleading to act as if crime is going down. Sure, it's lower than it was last year, but it's still roughly nine times higher than it was 11 years ago. Now, when it comes to assessing the frequency of dementia in the past, the further back you go, the harder it gets to get reliable numbers. As such, I'm going to use an approach that is commonly used by anthropologists and archaeologists when they're trying to learn about people from the distant past. And what they do is they study people that are still alive today that live in ways that are very similar to the ways of the past. So let's start by taking it to the furthest extreme. Consider the Tisamani and the Mozetan hunter-gatherer tribes of Bolivia. Researchers at the University of Southern California recently found that while rates of mild cognitive impairment among members of these tribes over the age of 60 are similar to Americans, the rates of dementia in these tribes are fully 11 times lower than that is found among 60 plus Americans. Now, unfortunately, I was unable to find similar research being done on other tribes, and I don't expect people to just figure, hey, these two tribes are necessarily representative of broader trends among hunter-gatherer tribes. And so I wanted to find more evidence. And so my next step was to check in on the Amish, as this is a group famous for their adherence to traditional family structures, traditional ways of doing things, and a staunch resistance to change and to new technologies. Research on the Amish community has found lower rates and later onsets of dementia and cognitive decline than is found among their American age-matched counterparts. Next, I checked on modern Western seniors living in larger households, preserving the intergenerational familial integrity that was common among hunter-gatherers. Now, while I wasn't able to find anything on the rates of dementia itself among people living in these larger households, what I was able to find was evidence that the rates of mortality associated with dementia are lower. So again, we're going in the same direction evidence-wise. Relatedly, I also looked to see if there are any sorts of relationships between religious participation in older age and dementia. I figured this was relevant because similar to hunter-gatherer living, religious participation tends to involve extensive community participation, as well as ongoing engagement with ideas traditions that believers have been engaged in all their lives. Unsurprisingly, research has found that religious participation in older adults seems to have a protective effect against dementia. So putting all of this together, a reasonable interpretation would be that while yes, there has been a recent decrease in dementia among American seniors the last couple of decades, there was also probably a radical increase in dementia that coincided with people living more and more like us and less and less like our distant ancestors. Again, when you take organisms out of their environment, all bets are off.
To understand how our distant ancestral ways have protected against dementia, it'll help to understand some psychology. So let's start off with cognitive psychology. Firstly, it is easier to understand and work with familiar things than new things. This is fairly uncontroversial and it's why experience helps. Second, it's easier to understand and work with concrete, actual things as opposed to abstract things. To give an example, it is less complicated, more easy to understand how to take an actual piece of paper and put it in a file folder than to take a Word document and put it into a folder on a hard drive. Third, dementia tends to hit short-term working memory much harder than long-term memory. A person with dementia, for example, will often find it much easier to remember where they went to dinner on their first date with their spouse 40 years ago than where they went to dinner with them yesterday. This also applies for memory for routines, skills, and habits. Those learned prior to significant cognitive decline will often persist despite continued cognitive decline. But on the other hand, as cognition declines, these things become harder and harder to learn. New facts, new skills, new habits, new routines, they all become more difficult to learn. The fourth thing we need to talk about is the notion of the just right challenge. So the idea here is if anybody wants to get better at anything, what they want to do is be spending a lot of their time training at a level that is challenging for them, but doable. So they have to try hard, but when they do try hard, they do pretty well. So they don't want to have a challenge that's way below them because they won't be forced to apply themselves maximally, to focus, to pay attention, to seek help, to learn, to grow. They won't need to, like they'll, they will, they'll be able to do the thing without even paying attention. They also don't want to go against a challenge that is way beyond them because in those circumstances, it's very frustrating, discouraging, whether they try their hardest or not at all, they tend to fail every single time. And so they're gonna give up easier, they're gonna pay less attention, they're gonna try less hard. Because of all these things, they're just simply gonna learn less, develop less. What they want is to be at their own level, at the challenge at their level, or maybe a little above them, such that they really have to try. But when they do, they do pretty good and they tend to get better over time just through practice and learning new things. Fifth, it has been consistently found that regular cognitive and physical exercise have protective effects against dementia. This is before the elder years and during. Exercise and cognitive activity have protective effects. Lastly, moving out of cognitive psychology and into the domain of mental health, it has to be said that people, by and large, they need to belong and they need to have a sense of identity and purpose and they need to feel valued. I think a big part of the reason why we observe lower rates, severity, and later onsets of dementia among people who live more like our ancestors and less like us is that these ancestral lifestyles better accommodate these psychological realities. Let's consider how. Firstly, lifestyles among hunter-gatherers, the Amish, and so forth are far, far more stable across time than is the case with us. It is probably not a stretch to say that the internet alone has induced more lifestyle changes for us in the last 30 years than a hunter-gatherer tribe would experience in over a thousand years. What is more, in contrast to contemporary Western culture where families are small, divorce is common, where people frequently relocate, switch jobs, schools, and they attend religious services less and so forth, hunter-gatherers and the Amish tend to stay with the same people for decades or lifetimes on end. So imagine you're getting up in age. If you're a contemporary Westerner, you're probably retiring. Further, there's a good chance that maybe you didn't have too many kids or grandkids, like maybe you did, but maybe you didn't. And if you did, maybe they don't live too close to you. And so maybe you don't see them anywhere near as often as you would have if you had been born 500 years ago. And if you're in a hunter-gatherer tribe, however, you're probably not so much retiring as you're changing how you engage with and contribute to your community. Maybe instead of doing the same arduous tasks that you used to do, 
you're mentoring others. You're training people in skills, sharing wisdom, helping to mediate disputes in the family and solve problems, looking after kids and grandkids. And you can actually do all of these things because the skills that people need to learn today, if you're in a hunter-gatherer tribe, are pretty much the same skills they would have needed to learn 50 years ago. It's not like you're retiring and in five years, the way that your work is done is significantly different. And it's not like your grandkids view you as dinosaurs because you're not on TikTok. The world is just not that different for your grandkids as compared to you when you were at their life stage, if you're in a hunter-gatherer tribe. So let's see how this hunter-gatherer lifestyle matches the cognitive realities that we discussed earlier. So remember we talked about how long-term memory tends to be much better preserved. Well, for hunter-gatherers in their elder years, the people they're dealing with are the same people that they've been dealing with for a long time. Same people. And the information that they have stored in their long-term memory, which is better preserved, is still very relevant today. The tasks of hunting, gathering, homestead building and maintenance, community defense and the like, these are the same tasks. And what is more, they are all concrete and physical, not very abstract. That's another thing. And if a person can no longer do all the things that they used to do, there's a good chance that there are still other things that they can do to help their community so they can find a new just right challenge. At every level, this sort of lifestyle fits our cognition like a glove, which is unsurprising given that these hunter-gatherer communities, their lifestyles are the result of many, many generations of cultural selection that was based upon biological foundations that were quite consistent. To hammer this lesson home, let's consider a case on the exact opposite extreme. I recently read about a recent study in China, which found that some Chinese seniors were enabled to take on retirement pensions early. And there is no reason to think that these seniors were different than the average Chinese senior. What was found was that this group began experiencing cognitive decline and dementia earlier than other seniors that did not get to retire earlier. And this should not be surprising at all. They're not working anymore and religious participation is very low in China. So they're surely not engaging anywhere near as much as they were pre-retirement. And meanwhile, since retirement, the world has only continued to change faster and faster and faster, leaving them further and further behind, making it harder to participate when they want to. That does it for this video. If you want to get a free educational dementia management session with me, just like I offer to patients regularly, check out part two.